Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Connie Anderson. So Connie's come recommended to me as an expert in tracking, particularly from a Native American point of view. Um, I've been trying. I've been looking at his website, but it's in Swedish. So I'm more curious than than anything else. Um, and I think this is a super interesting subject. So Connie, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Tell us a little bit about your life story. How did you get interested in your work, but particularly as regards your story around the body? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, my journey started like um, four years old boy uh, in Stockholm. Um, um, I saw that the, the life were a, um, a big mystery and I just sensed that um, I need to uh, investigate this mystery. And I felt that uh, there is something, some, something is hiding the truth about uh, our life. So I decided four years old, I will investigate life and find the truth. And uh, actually that's uh, what I've been doing for all my life, I'm 53 years old now and living in Stockholm and uh, have a school that um, helping people to uh, enhance their awareness by this um, uh, Native American philosophy, uh, observation, tracking, and uh, actually be much more in communication with your, your spirit, your, your, mm, your mind and your body. So you're using your body as a tool to find your um, awareness. Okay, so tell us about, so you're, you're a child, you have this realization, now you're doing tracking courses. What happened in between? Give us a few more. A few more Absolutely. Questions. So um, by following my, my inner vision, my inner uh, voice to find the truth, I, I was so curious about our history. Um, about um, uh, all the detectives in movies and books. And uh, I was so uh, impressed of the nature also, the, all the animals, how they can find out things by just observing, and just knowing. So when I grew up, I, I tried different work, but I couldn't find any work that I really could uh, be... Um, uh, be in love with because you know uh, my work have to be so, g- give me something more than salary so I was actually looking for a purpose uh, that was resonating with the four-year-old boy hmm. so so I started to traveling around traveling around the world for five years when I was about 20 years old after I d- did the military service here in Sweden so after that, I decided to uh, find a job that I really had passionate for, so I, I can also looking for the truth. So I, I chose to be a police officer, and was trained for three years, and uh, was re- finding a really passionate um, mission, working in in the streets. So I, I became a street cop, not a not not a street policeman, but a street cop. What's and, the difference? You know, Sorry, what's the difference? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a huge difference, you know. Um, early, early in the years of uh, policing, uh, I found there are two categories of uh, policemen. One is policemen and one is cops. And the cops were the passionate one who was following their heart and was not corrupted. They, they couldn't be corrupted. And they have this uh, mission to, um, to find the truth. So I, I choose early to be a cop, and um, and uh, it's maybe it's about five percent, maybe ten percent, not more than that, who is the cops. So uh, it was easy to find. Uh, you know, we cops. should maybe say for the listeners that my experience of the Swedish police has been very positive, actually. I've consistently had a fairly good impression of them, and you know, fifty percent of our listeners are in the United States, which has got a very different vibe. And, um, you know, Britain is different from other countries as well. So, I mean, you know, maybe you could say a little bit more about that reality. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
when I started the police academy, and um, it is actually one of the one of of the most uh, ambitious police uh, academy in the world. It's three years of study, and it's actually the people's police. Uh, so you're working for the people, and that's why I choose also to be a policeman because I I felt that I, I I can be uh, with this, with this job with my heart to actually help people, and um, uh, so, so the corruption inside the the police force is is minimal, is uh, is almost nothing, mm. uh, because there is an honor to be a, a policeman. It's quite a different orient. I've come across the Netherlands and you get it in Britain a little bit and other countries far less. Like I lived in Brazil where the police would just steal from you, you know, and Absolutely. Um, yeah. it's very different reality. And I think listeners might not understand that mm. it, there's also a paradox, isn't there? That Sweden, one of the most liberal countries in the world, being yeah. the person who enforces mm. the rules in one of Absolutely. the countries in the world. There's a kind of paradox in that. Absolutely. And often as a police officer, you, you got a call from citizen and they're asking you for different advice. So mm -hmm. here in Sweden, uh, the citizen have a, a lot of faith in, um, mm -hmm. in, in the police also. So, the first, first time I tried to ask a policeman for directions in the United States, I was quite shocked because I was used to British police who saw themselves as public servants who would kind of absolutely. friendly, give you a bit of advice. And, and the absolutely. policeman said to me, I don't look like, do I look like tourist information to you, boy? And I was like, <laughs> okay, sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you're not shooting people quite so readily as well, right? Like, <laughs> no. It's rare it's, for someone to be shot, even though the police have guns, right? Absolutely, yeah. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really um, getting into your... Your, your moral, your ethics as a policeman here in Sweden, that uh, you should protect the people, you should uh, help the people. And um, it's, it's all with you. It's, so it's, um, it's not a tool for the, the power. It's more like uh, helping uh, the, the little man in the society. And up to what year did you do this? Was this before the sort of big immigration wave? Because I've heard Swedish yeah. policemen talk about that and how that changed things and delicate kind of subject matter. But that seemed to be a big thing for the Swedish police that I spoke to. Like they, their life changed quite radically over a few years. Absolutely. You're, you're correct. That the large immigrant um, almost storm here in Sweden was ar around 2015. And I... I, I quit my job as a police officer in 2011 after 20 years on the streets. So, uh, and I felt uh, it's time now to to leave this beautiful work. But you know, the <laughs> the organization had had become so corrupt, so I, so I couldn't stand uh, anymore um, uh, uh, facing the corruption inside the the police work organization. Do you mean like, like financially, or what? What kind of thing do you mean? It it was uh, on the higher levels. Um, there was uh, key positions, uh, uh, chiefs, leaders who were corrupt and uh, choose to uh, misguide society and also the policemen. Misguide around. If I don't mind me asking, I'm just curious about this particular. Absolutely. Case. For ex for example, um, as as a cop, you wanted to to find um, the reason behind the crime, uh -huh. not not, uh -huh. not the effect, not not the crime. So as a cop, you 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 start digging, and then you see the reason, and it's at the root of the problem you you find. But uh, this corrupt organization that have overtaken the police society, they they stop you. And I was uh, being ordered to look in the other direction when I was confronting the organized crime and mafia. Wow! So they knew something deeper was going on and didn't really want it to be yeah. to be to be found out. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, the Swedish yeah. mafia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This I don't and, know. No, exactly. And and those times it was in a few suburb, suburbs around Stockholm. It was maybe four or five different suburbs around Stockholm that it was organized crime and they have almost taken over the, the suburbs. But today it's almost in every suburbs in Stockholm. So it's a huge uh, 
development in a, in a bad uh, directions. And I heard there were some very uncomfortable questions about uh, ethnicity and immigration and sort of where certain crime was coming from and issues around rape. And it, yeah. it, the cases I heard were that people really were sort of asked not to make the obvious conclusions um, or, or asked not to look at things. They were called racist if they even dared. And Absolutely. it seemed like a pretty uncomfortable situation. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's so dominant um, uh, groups from um, Muslim countries, uh, from Afghanistan, from uh, um, uh, Arabic countries and North, North Africa cu- countries, who is uh, the perpetrator uh, of gang rape, rapes, for example. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's really, really obvious here in Sweden, especially yeah. after 2015. Yeah. And I, I had the police just refuse to have data on kind of who was yeah. doing it because they didn't want the kind of speak to be called racist or something like this, even yeah. though we seem to, because it's a political thing, right? Like if there's a big yeah. issue around immigration and some are for it and some against yeah. it. And it, it, weirdly, Swedish crime has become world famous as a political football for the left and the right. And I've yeah. seen, you know, I've seen a number of videos on it and I was like, why am I, yeah. why am I following this, this kind of fairly obscure thing? So I hope you don't mind me asking about it. That's just a... No, it's perfect. And, and we need to, to, to see the truth. You know, we, we need to be brave. We need to have a courage to, to see the truth. Yeah. And it's not, it's not about racism. In, in my belief, there, is no, there are no races. Yeah. We are one. We are all people and the different um, looks and skin colors heights and it doesn't matter you know we, yeah. we are all we are all the same and i uh and culture people, absolutely and, and people if, if they think i'm a racist it's the opposite i i, I used to be married to a, a woman from south america and yeah. i just love love cu- culture i've been in africa i've been all around the globe and i just love people yeah. and i just love the culture so yeah. but we have to see the truth Let's look at the reality of different cultures and different behaviors and different people who might have trauma and other reasons yeah. for it. But there's, there's, there was a case in Rotherham in the UK with the police that was become very famous where police were looking the other way because of not wanting to be considered racist or whatever. And yeah. uh, that, that they've been, you know, since that's been sorted out as far as I know. Anyway, let's get on to the main topic of today, which is tracking. So obviously yeah. as a policeman, you're looking for clues, you're tracking. <laughs> you, you've got interested in this like Native American way of doing it, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So d- during the, the hard, work, hard um, times when I was um, working against the mafia and organized crimes, I, I tried to find a solution because th- this is not a new problem. Uh, mafia have, have been around the, the, the communities for for ages you know um it's well known for for a long 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 time so what i found out is that the most effective way to uh, to stop crime is actually to see to to know um because the crime itself needs uh, something to be covered mm-hmm. so w- when you can't see it's where the crime will be actually be de- taking part so the the easiest way to stop crime is to be there to be aware and to see it and that, that's what i found out and uh, me and my my cops we actually developed the, the skill of observation and sensing we were sensing crime you know we felt this um, awareness we, so we could just sense we call it uh, 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 cop uh, sensing <laughs> I spoke to a woman in England who worked at, um, in, at uh, not immigration, uh, yeah, immigration in, in the airports, and her job was stopping drug dealers. Yeah. And she said she got very good at observing, like, there's new shoes on that person, yeah. or, exactly. or this person just looks a bit more stressed than the other tra- travelers. Yeah. And then yeah. she said sometimes she didn't know what it was that she could see, but she just felt even if they didn't fit the profile or whatever, she just felt something was wrong and she'd stop them and then, you know, be full of, have a suitcase full of heroin or whatever. Absolutely. And when you feel it, you just know it. Yeah. And then, then you can use your other senses um, without, you start with your six senses, you know, the, the gut feeling, 
uh, and then you start to observe it with your eyes and you start to listen and even actually use, use your nose. Nose is um, a sense that we seldom use, but uh, we have the ability as a human, we can smell fear, we can smell love, we can smell different uh, attitudes and, and state of, of a, a person. So actually, during the, those years, I, I developed my nose, so I, I can feel, I can smell it, how people were, uh, what which state they were in. And um, often, when when I was ordered to a home where they ha had heard violence, and when I opened the door to the home, I can feel the, the same smell of fear and aggression, and that was obvious for me year after year so i was like hmm this is interesting this is what our ancestors should uh, use their senses to to investigate to know and then i started to to make my own study and uh, looking for the history and i found the native american way of tracking that they, they, they had this phenomenon way how to actually see almost the invisible so I start studying, and that uh, techniques were almost vanished. So I, st I started, and I started inv investigating, uh, and I got this uh, police scholarship. So I, I went to the United States, and I found um, my um, my teacher, and I did some courses, and I started to uh, practice it as a cop here in Sweden, and I become the expert. So the police sent you to study with Native Americans. That's fantastic. And yeah. there's a lot of hunting in Sweden, right? I mean, that's a popular hobby, but they lost some of the tracking skills that they may, they must have had back in the, back in yeah. the day, you know, the Vikings mm. going through the woods. I imagine they must have had Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You're, you're correct. Yes. Um, but, but the modern hunters, they're using uh, dogs. And here in Sweden, uh, it's one of the few countries that you can let go of your dog and just send it away for kilometers, and they have this GPS uh, special um, phones, and they, you, you can follow your dog just running, a one, running around in the woods for like three kilometers away, and it's allowed. And um, ma many countries, it, it's forbidden because it, it disturbed all the, the, um, the, the, the nature and all the whole the, this uh, communication in, in nature. For example, our, our 2014 i was in uh, zimbabwe and uh, working with the rangers to uh, to protect the rhinos against the poachers and uh, i was working there for two two weeks and i was helping them i educated them in in tracking also and uh, they they said that if if uh, a dog will come into their um, their the park where where all the animals wild animals were, were they will shoot the dog directly because the dog will affect the whole nature. Interesting. Was, mm. Yeah, it would mess up. So let's start with the basics then. So I know nothing about this. Like, what are the basics of tracking? The basics of tracking is, is you. You you are actually tracking yourself. You can only know me by uh, have impression of me. You know, the light from me. The, the sound from me, the smell, the vibration from me have to come into your senses and into your body. Your impression, your input will be insight. There, you will actually see me inside of you. So therefore, you have to stand still, open up your, your senses, and, and just wait for the process to uh, be uh, aware inside of you. So by reading all the impression with your eyes, ears, nose, hands, and gut feelings, you start to learn instead of just uh, consuming information. So when you're now, now you're actually attracting me. You you are learning who oh. is Connie yeah, exactly. Yeah. You hear my voice, my my temperament, my my speed, uh, the rhythm. It's interesting that mindfulness says pay attention, but there was never really a good reason for it. I mean, obviously it's healthy in this, but I've learned, for example, I started doing videos and I'd record videos and all of a sudden I was paying attention to the light in the room and the sound quality because I had a reason to. Yeah. And 
you know, to really to study or when I started dating and I'd look at a woman's responses, you know, do her eyes mm. open or, you know, whatever, does she breathe? And, relax? and it's like to have that reason to pay attention. Yes. That makes the really, for me, that always honed the senses much more, whether it was an artistic reason or practical mm. reason like tracking, uh, it always honed mm. the senses much more. And the other thing yeah. I'm hearing from you here is the necessity for quiet so that you, you're you able to be still and notice. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. And I just love your re- reflection about the reason, because that's the key. And what I love about this Native American way of tracking is actually it's, it's a lifestyle. You don't have to have a special room or training uh, equipment for this, because this is life. And what it does with you, it's searching for truth so um uh, I've, I've been asking many times so connie what is the track you're looking for i'm not looking for tracks they're coming to me you know insights coming into me what i'm looking for is the truth and the truth is inside of you and truth is actually from a latin word uh, about sum sum means i i am so you can only know by yourself with the Latin word sum. I am. You know, it's interesting. We've already gone quite deep here. You know, as you say, it's, I was expecting you to say, well, you look for a broken tree branch or, you know, <laughs> a, a disturbed rock or something like that. But it's, this is this very internal, I mean, you know, it's, it makes you, if anything, a better fit for the podcast. But um, uh, it, yeah. in some ways it doesn't surprise me, but we've gone straight in there. Yeah, and actually, um, what it is is actually movement. We we talking about embodiment, so a tracker using um, the body, all the senses, all the um, all the um, possibility to actually to detect yourself with the connection with everything. So uh, when I was four years old, I know I am a part of everything. So when I'm a part of everything, I can actually know everything, but I have to be in contact with everything. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with that insight, I use it and I develop my curiosity. I was so curious and I'm still very cu- curious. And I'm curious about you. I'm curious about myself and I'm curious with, with all, all meetings and all meetings is a good conversation. So how do you teach this then? You're out in the woods, you've got a couple of people or a group, and yeah. what, what do you do? You're just, just, just quiet down, you see what comes, you start, okay, there's something over there, you start moving that way. How does it work? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, what I teach is um, I have my school here just outside Stockholm. It's mm-hmm. an old mansion from 1740s, mm-hmm. uh, and actually that's my favorite uh, history um, ages around 1700s. And um, here we, we have, I have my school and, 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 I, and I lead them I, and I coach them to, to actually use their body, their s- senses to observe and wait for the learning. And what they are actually tracking is all the movement because tracks is movement. You are a track. You're a track from your mother and father. You're also a track for all the things you're eating what you are thinking, what you have experienced, what your needs is, what you're longing for. I can see your face changing. And I, that's a movement. That's a track for me. So not looking for the answer. You're looking for another question. So tracking is um, driven by your questions. Like all, like all the children, you know? You, you know, when, when you're conversating with a child, they're... They're giving you thousands of questions and they're not interested in, in the answer because that, that is killing the adventure. They ju- so they, they're just like, wow, what is that? How is this functioning? How old is it? And the, the, often the grown-up people like, like us, they, they, we are trying to make a, 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 like a clever answer, but they're not interested in, in the, the answer. They want to come on. Let's investigate this together. So, yeah, yeah. If you say to a kid, "How old do you think it is?" or if you say, yeah. "It's two hundred, I'm two, like a child says, "How old are you?" I say, "I'm two hundred and twelve." 
And they say, yeah. no, you're not. But then they're more, in, they're like more interested because they get to ask it. And they get exactly. like, you're, no, you're like my dad's age, you know, like, like, do you know, yeah. what I mean? like it's more interesting <laughs> just telling them I'm 40 years old. You know? Absolutely. Exactly. So, um, you know, and also I was interviewed by a national television and they, they, they said that after, after the interview, the, the female uh, reporter, she said that, hmm, isn't this about relationship? And I said, yes, of course. Think about this. When you come home af- after a day and your partner seeing you, knowing you, make questions about you, mm. are interesting, and see the details where you're coming from and how you feel. Yeah, yeah, just uh, are you okay? You know, sometimes, yeah. right? like, hey, you seem stressed. Yeah, and, and that's connection. You know, it's it's you're interesting. You want to learn about more about yourself. And and actually, have you seen the film Avatar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those beautiful, be- beautiful blue <laughs> beings. What they say when they say hello? They say, "I see you." Actually, what they say is, "I see you as a unique person. Where yeah. you're coming from? What your um, your passion is about? Where you're going?" So uh, people, what I usually say to my students is that you're not normal. And often there is a silence in the classroom because they think it's something bad not to be normal. But I said, you are unique. Every part, every one of you are, is unique. Look at you. Nobody is dressing the same. You're sitting different. You're talking different. And you're on a unique pathway through your life. Quick interruption to tell you about my book, Embodiment, creatively named, hey? Actually, Embodiment, Moving Beyond Mindfulness. You can find this online at theembodimentbook.com. That's theembodimentbook.com. Um, so this book is an introduction to the whole field. If you like these interviews, you'll probably love this book. Um, funny stuff, poems, personal stories from my life, illustrating what embodiment is all about, and loads for professionals in the field too. Uh, top teaching tips, language tips, that kind of thing. Yeah, real condensation of um, everything I've learned about embodiment, basically. Um, so you can get pre-orders at Amazon.com, and if you just put in embodiment moving beyond mindfulness, that's the name of the book, or go to theembodimentbook.com. On there, you'll see quotes from various teachers, a bunch of fun illustrations, and you can also get the first chapter completely free online at theembodimentbook.com. Enjoy, and back to the interview. And what I'm really hearing here as well is that you're essentially teaching tracking not as an art in itself, but as a, it sounds like as much as a way to develop a certain set of skills, a certain mindset, yeah. a certain way of being. Absolutely. And so uh, I use three parts when I'm teaching tracking. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it, when you think about pathfinders, it's the same. You know, It's like uh, finding your pathway through life. And, uh, and, and also uh, learn which uh, decisions you have to, to make in, in life. So I use three tools. One is philosophy um, about uh, everything has a meaning. Number two, the explanation about tracks. What is a track? Number three is about questioning. Uh, make questions, not the answer. Like Socrates says, the only one who can know is the one who makes the question. So those three th- things uh, I use to make the foundation for the students. So mm-hmm. everything has a meaning, uh, philosophy around tracks, what is a track, and uh, make questions, not answer. Never assume, only know by, by, by your own senses. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Yeah. Practically, like, do you give people like tasks or games? You creep up on deer and touch them on the nose. I mean, like, like what are the what are like the? Like, let me understand like how this actually looks. Yeah, from that philosopher philosophic way, you, you we start to practice, and it's about how you use your your eyes, for example. Today, a lot of people are living in a stressful world. They try to survive instead of living. 
that's a huge difference between living and surviving. Surviving is you're running away, you have a tunnel vision, you're afraid, you're stressed, you have you're being worried. But the Native American life is about living. You're living in life. You're living in love. You're living in uh, in cooperation. Uh, you uh, have faith in life. And when you do that, your vision change from tunnel vision when you stress and uh, afraid. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. start to see the world in wide vision. You see, yeah, yeah, it literally changes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So by using that, you start to live actually in meditative state. So uh, when you uh, live as a tracker, you live actually in a meditative state and, and um, receive all the information. And the, and the other thing is how you move. That's what I also teach. We people are actually... Uh, made to walk on toes, not on the heels. Today we have we have become a heel walker, you know, like a zombie. <laughs> and uh, where you what you can see today is people like looking down in the pavement and just walking, and they're full mm -hmm. of, in mind that they're not there. They, there is no awareness, and they just like wa walking pretty hard, and you can hear them stump uh, loudly. But actually, what, what we are made of is uh, a, a huge muscle call, uh, we call cal, cal, calf, calf. Calf, calf muscle. Calf, exactly, yeah. calf. And that muscle is the second heart of uh -huh. our body because we're a standing animal and the heart is pretty up, high up. And the blood from the foot have to, to, to be transported uh, vertically. And when you start to stand on your toes, you're activating that big muscle, the second heart, and it's helping pumping up the, the blood also. And what it also makes us, uh, when we start moving on the toes, we are getting much more. You know, it's a, it's a saying, this person, he was or she was on, on the toes. On the toes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you start to be much more active, you're aware. Um, and all the sports is actually you. You have to be on your toes if you you're, you're fighting, you're boxing, move, you're yeah, dancing. You yeah. Thai boxer, they in Thai boxing they put um, yeah. colored chalk on the heels, and if huh? the, if the color touches the ground, the teacher hits you with a stick. If oh, the, <laughs> your heels, then you learn Thai boxing. <laughs> so, if you learn pretty fast then. <laughs> that's the harsh way to learn, maybe, but uh, it's quick. <laughs> and do you teach people not to get tracked? Like, yeah. do you, for example, like I can imagine you're like you're playing the ultimate game game of hide and seek. Yeah, or hide and seek as they call it in America. So, yeah. like, like, like I've often had this fantasy that I'd love to turn up in a city for a holiday and pay some criminals to try and find me. Yeah, and I give them the double the money if they find me. You know, <laughs> and just spend like two days being tracked through the city and having to avoid them. <laughs> Absolutely, you're correct. You are all, all tracker already. That's what I hear. And uh, what, what we're playing with is, is hide and seek. And uh, you know, if you are a, a hidden camera, you will see much more. So by by um, being so much invisible as possible, then you 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 will not affect the world around you because it's it's, it's really easy to to actually disturb your area r around you and what you see is actually your own tracks often right. people are, are projecting themselves so when they meet other people and they, they see a reaction but they don't understand it's a reaction from you so they actually are tracking themselves so by by be uh, like like you're moving silently um, and and uh, without making this concentric rings this uh, uh, f um, tracks around them they, they they will see the world much more clear so we are practicing hide and seek pretty much <laughs> and there is a native american uh, game they call the coop have you heard about coop we have to touch people exactly counting coop yeah <laughs> a can counting coop exactly and uh, when a coup is really worth something maybe 
a wild, dangerous animal or an enemy, then you have um, the um, the uh, then you can carry a feather, an uh, eagle feather in your hair. So when you see Native American Indian wearing eagles fe yeah. feathers, it's because they have done a great uh, coup. So you creep up on a wolf and bop exactly. it on the nose and then run away before it eats you. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Or and and uh, actually, my my teacher's teacher, he uh, his name was Stalking Wolf. Yeah. Because when he was a small boy, he succeeded to uh, uh, stalk, track and stalk and touch a, a wild wolf on his back. And that's why he, his name was Stalking Wolf. My wife does this with cats. My wife likes cats and she has a way of <laughs> approaching them so they don't know. And she's very quiet in the house. I never know when she's here or not. Wow. It's like some people, she's naturally very light footed. And mm -hmm. I have another colleague like this and she, I don't know when she's in meetings. I'll say, where's Vilja? Come on, it's time to start the meeting. And then she'll be next to me. <laughs> she, she doesn't, neither of them disturb space much. I'm the wow. only one like, I'd be so <laughs> but he's my wife and this colleague they're one's russian one's ukrainian they're, they're, they're sort of angular they slip mm. in the shadows you they, you okay. either miss them in a way you know and it's yeah absolutely yeah it's great and uh, these uh, apache scouts trackers used to call called be called ghosts or shadow people yeah and they yeah. they have the skill of actually being so invisible that uh, people just could feel and sends the shadows from them, and uh, those those uh, uh, Apache scouts they were actually uh, uh, they were learning from wolves, and and just copy uh, the way wolves were were tracking how they were listening. I uh, used the nose and hands and communication how they moved and being really really silent. So. The ghost people were the Apache trackers, and uh, the name Scout, what, what is often used as a tracker in the Native American um, culture, Scout is actually a French word from the immigrants, French immigrants, uh, and um, it is from the French word écouter, that means to listen. So what what they saw about the, the, this those um, Apache scouts that were they were standing often pretty st still for a long time for hours just like listen listen to the nature listen to the animal listen to the wind and th th that's what I did actually when I was working as a ranger in Zimbabwe 2014 helping to protect the rhinos against uh, poachers we had a um, a uh, training day so there were two rangers who were uh, acting as a poacher into this wild, you know, and we had, you know, <laughs> a lot of dangerous animals where, we're, where we, we uh, were tracking. There were lions and elephant and uh, rhinos, of course, and, and uh, different wild big animals. And um, uh, we, uh, we were patrolling the area and we, we didn't know where, where they were coming. So we were going by jeep uh, along the, those uh, dirt roads, and we're going back and forth, back and forth. And I said to the to the leader, "Could I give you a could could I give you a suggestion? Why don't we just stop the car and turn off the engine and just listen to listen to the nature?" And uh, we did. So we're just standing there in this beautiful powerful nature where you can have this all these big animals and after a while i hear the silence up on the hill and i said i hear the silence and they just look at me and they didn't understand what i meant it is like man is the most dangerous animals on this planet yeah. so and the other animals are quiet when the guy comes by right like hide and seek and i said let's go up on, on the hill and we went up and we we found new fresh footprints of the the poachers yeah yeah interesting so also it's listening for what disturbs the pattern isn't it yeah absolutely is it a mixed blessing i mean i imagine you're sort of noticing lots of things all the time 
Yeah, it is, but it's also sometimes it's dangerous. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, absolutely, because uh, today we have uh, different reasons that people are lying and cheating uh, okay. and manipulating, and they are really keen on to keep that a secret. Right, so, right. Yeah. Like, like one of the things I've become aware of is when someone's menstruating, for example, yeah. and it's it sounds gross to some people. I can smell it. No, yeah. it's not like stinky, but a, it's like a feeling. And yeah. that's kind of something that someone would rather keep private quite often. Yeah. And I'm a little uncomfortable sometimes. And it's like, well, do I really want to be noticing that? Do you know what I mean? And I can't not uh, notice it. I'm not trying uh, to notice it. I'm not sniffing people, you know. But it's, <laughs> it's just something that I notice now. And I, I don't know if it, I think it's a mixture of signals that I pick up. Yeah. And, and I go, oh. And sometimes I'll say it, but more often than not, I won't because it feels a bit intrusive, you know? Yeah, but but uh, it's natural. Uh, and you, you you have been given that gift because uh, how could you know when a woman is fertile? Because just uh -huh. once, a few days uh, every month, uh, yeah. a woman is fertile. Yeah. And actually, th there is a way also to smell when the, the egg is... Uh, the ovulation. Ov ov ovulation. ovulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Women move different when that's happening for sure. But uh, I don't know if I smell it, but they move different. Yeah. Feel it has, and it just you know, it, it was one day a few years ago with my ex-girlfriend. We were sitting in a, in a sofa yeah. in our home. Yeah. And yeah. I was, was sitting there and then I felt this different smell. I never felt it before. Yeah. I was thinking, and it just came to me and I said, ah, ovulation. <laughs> and I turned my face towards my girlfriend and said i feel something i haven't uh, smelled before do we have ovulation <laughs> and she was looking at me and <laughs> reaction was like no and then she became quiet and then she picked up her calendar in a little bit secretly and just looking and th then she said yes i have ovulation <laughs> and that's you know natural because otherwise how could we know oh, honestly sickness too right like there's a way in which yeah. someone's about to get sick or they say some animals can smell cancer and things like this you know like yeah. i can imagine there's some pretty good evolutionary case for these kind of things about fertility and sickness mm. things like this that I'm, I'm wondering if our ancestors weren't sort of crazy skilled in a way that we can't imagine without mm. the perfumes without the sort of modern yeah. life like i could imagine yeah. if some things were very obvious to them that we would be totally blind to absolutely that's yeah. i am convinced that our ancestors were much more uh, advanced because they had they were training all the time they they didn't have so much uh, disrupt, uh, disruption uh, with the electronic uh, equipment and things like that and mm. they, they were more uh, dependent on their body and their own decision mm -hmm. so, interesting interesting yeah. and you are interesting because you know what you are yourself <laughs> <laughs> well, for me as a trainer we have a lot of trainers and coaches i'm more tracking the group so for example i'm yeah. tracking the rooms like energy levels are people tired yeah like recently i was a colleague was teaching and she asked people said oh you it was after six days of training and she said are you good to go and she was like yeah, yeah, yeah. the group was like yeah we're fine and i just felt like they were actually exhausted underneath what they were saying yeah i felt like she didn't really want to teach the session and it turned out that she was only really teaching it because we was teaching it for a colleague and she felt like obliged to do it because they weren't able to because the colleague was ill mm. and i just interrupted the session which i normally never normally do and said look rachel why don't we just take a half hour break instead of doing the session and everyone <laughs> cheered she looked totally relieved and it was like i just somehow tracked that she didn't really want to teach and they didn't really want to learn and what they really wanted was just a cup of tea and a chat with each other and we did the unthinkable of changing the schedule and just having a half hour unplanned break you know wow and that was from looking at the group do you know what i mean yeah. and it's, it's as I think all the coaches out there, we're doing this a lot, right? And yoga teachers mm. listening to this, they're, uh, is this posed too much for people? Because people, yeah. people try and hide their reactions, so it becomes a, a game of hide and seek, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, today we, we think that tracking is in, in the nature because the, the Native American lived in the nature, but, but it's not because tracking is 
tracking yourself, your own emotion, your reaction, your your the the smell, the all the the sound that that you have. And so in every actually um, uh, relation that you have with people, with uh, the area, with the room, with the situation is tracking. You can't live actually if you don't track. If you can't observe and understand what is uh, the, the situation, you can't you can't function. Functioning, you, you can't uh, take decisions. So uh, the more open you are, the more can you actually have your impression, input, and have insight of yourself. So it's the observation skill of of learning. In, it's not consuming um, su- uh, superficial uh, information, mm. and also like, like like you also said also mm. like the uh, uh, high and seek is also not it's to control your own movements, you control your own uh, tracks. So. And- it strikes me that embodiment really as a field is is returning to this idea of self-tracking, of being yeah. aware of one's own self. And I, I feel tremendously sad when I see people who are angry or stressed and then not even realizing it. I, yeah. I, it was really fun. I've been last, I spent the week in the countryside with students, really an embodied, deep and very caring community. And then I came back and I was at the station and I was around just a lot of people who just seemed very stressed and unhappy, but mm. they weren't tracking that. It was invisible to them. So it yeah. wasn't they were suffering, but for a reason, which may be noble and beautiful and useful at times, but it was that they were suffering and they'd lost track, if we say that, lost track, yeah. of the fact that they were even suffering. So they were operating out of anxiety and aggression and sort of fear mindset without knowing that was what was driving them. Uh, exactly. That's a bullseye. And, you know, Almost all the victims I, I met as a as a police officer, all of them, they know that they uh, would go into a criminal uh, situation. They know that they they would they would be a victim because all their senses said, "Don't go into that apartment. Don't go into that wood. Don't go into the elevator. Don't follow this person." They all know, but they never listen. I heard. So, Gavin Becker, right? The Gift of Fear is yeah. an ex-policeman from the state. He wrote a whole book about this that yeah. he said the same thing. He said every single case of a rape or, you know, serious assault or, you know, you can't know in murders, obviously, but I'm mm. guessing the same would be that someone said this didn't feel right. Exactly. But I overrode Correct. that. I said, don't be silly. Exactly. And, and today we have so much, so many people who are getting exhausted. They, they, they're pushing themselves. They, they, they go to work and they're working too much and they never can say no. And, and they, are, they are distancing uh, themselves from their, all the feelings, what they need. And uh, they're losing themselves. They're losing track of themselves, as you said. So uh, and by doing that, they, uh, they they got um, uh, exhausted. So uh, by uh, training yourself as a tracker, then you start to understand which one is my track, which one is other tracks. You know, uh, one, one thing is really interesting that uh, I used to live in the city, and sometimes when I'm walking in in the streets in the in the evenings and in darkness, sometimes I I, I was meeting people coming towards me along the sidewalk. And, and for long distance, when they're walking towards me, I was feeling fear. And I was thinking, wow, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I wondered, why am I afraid? Maybe I'm afraid of that person going towards me. And I was like, really, really feeling and under um, and investigating, is that my fear or something else? And during the time I was continuing to walk towards this this person i was like really sensing and when i met this person i was feeling that okay i would just say polite hello or something that then i saw the head turn away and then i understand it was not my fear i felt it was his fear i felt so uh, scientists have have uh, proven that fear is contagious yeah all emotions for sure for sure absolutely yeah 
and we don't know if it's us or them because yeah. <laughs> we've only got one system. It's all yeah. one system. So it's like, am I happy because am I laughing because you're laughing, or am I laughing because I'm happy? Right? Like there's like, oh. <laughs> like we, yeah. we're empathic creatures, and then it's, it's yeah. separating that out is is like, is this my stress or theirs? Right? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. From yeah, absolutely, point, that makes total sense, and. And we can only see through our own lens. Like I do this exercise where I get everyone to screw up their noses, like in <laughs> like disgust, and we call it angry bunny rabbits from a guy called Paul. And then they look at, around the room and they look up <laughs> not doing it and they feel like there's a problem with them. Hmm. And then we get them to relax and open and soften and look at the same people again who haven't changed and they rate the people better. Ah. Nice the people, that, you know, their thoughts are more generous, you know. And it's, wow. it's like we're seeing the world how we are as well, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so by tra- by by practicing tracking to to see, understand, and investigate your movements, your uh, your tracks, your uh, 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 what do you call it, um, uh, changing the environment around you to 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 understand other people's. Um, pushing the environment and their tracks and their signs and their communication also. So, so w- w- when you start to understand the differences between your tracks, if, if I'm reacting or acting, then you start to b- be much more aware about yourself. So it, it's not so much about nature because you are nature. So understanding your tracks and other tracks. And tracks is movements. Everything is a mov- movement. So. Connie, this is fascinating, but we need to wrap up just because of time. A um, couple of things to finish there. In terms of finding out more about you, um, yep. you've got a website which is Tracker One. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. And that's in English, Tracker One, but the website's actually in Swedish, isn't it? Yeah. I will change it. I, I will make uh, English. A little button. Uh, press, yeah. And is there any other English resources online, like you have a YouTube or anything else? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel, and it's a Tracker School Sweden. I have a uh, Instagram called uh, uh, Konu Tracker One. Got it. Yeah, I'm gonna add you on Instagram, and if I'm in uh, Stockholm, I'll definitely look you up. Absolutely, so, uh, I'm looking been... forward forward to meet you, brother. It's been really fascinating, actually. Like, there's something in me that there's something <laughs> in me that like lights up with this topic. I wonder if it's like we all have this. Or many of us have this hunter instinct that must have been through the generations. You know that it's like oh, I used yeah. to take kids rock pooling. We used to take them to the beach, and they would look in. They'd look for animals under stones, you know, and try and find the oh. little animal under the in the sea. And kids would do it. Even really urban, cynical teenagers would do yeah. it for hours, hours. Oh. Like yeah. some instinct would come out where they would after the initial cynicism, they would love it. And then eventually we'd always have to drag them home because they wouldn't want to leave, you know? And um, yeah, it's some instinct yeah. gets enlivened by this idea of tracking and things like that. Let's do a hide and seek, you and me in the city. I Let's would do love it. to. You can, find, yeah. you can find me in Stockholm. I buy you a beer. How about that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a vegan, so that, 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 that's good. Like that's my idea of a good holiday. Okay, yeah. so so this has been great, man. Do you have a closing message about the body at all? Wow. Trust your body uh, and uh, never assume. Always investigate with your body because your body is a superpower and um, the, the greatest journey is inside of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really unique one. I've done over 200 podcasts and this has definitely been unique. So um, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's 
less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on the EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.